Hello. This is pre-recorded for any of you who don't know that. Welcome to the chat about Stoner by John Williams. I figured um, we'll have everybody introduce themselves and then I have bullet point plot summaries because I know some of y'all, it's been a while since you've read it. And I'm sure some of the people that are going to tune into this chat will also appreciate a quick reminder of plot points. Um, so, Philip, if you want to start by introducing yourself. Sure. Yeah, I'm Philip Chase, manga expert. You might have noticed that. Uh, I, well, not really. <laughs> so I, I've been enjoying uh, some wonderful collaborations with Murphy doing uh, some really great manga, uh, which is my introduction to the medium. But actually, my channel is really mostly about fantasy. I cover fantasy and uh, love the genre. By day, I am uh, an English professor and medievalist, so this is going to be an interesting discussion for me. <laughs> and Jimmy? Yeah, I'm Jimmy Nuts from the Fantasy Network, where I do all types of bookish content. <laughs> I do long-form bookish uh, discussions in a kind of a podcast format. I do reviews um, and all the other stuff that comes along with uh, being someone that talks about books on YouTube. Also have a manga channel over at Dudes Talking Manga, uh, where I cover manga poorly. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Stoner was a book that I never expected to read. Uh, it was actually picked from one of my patrons on my random wheel one month. And I thought it was about drugs and it was not at all. And it ended up being awesome. So I'm happy and then to be you here. forced the rest of the internet to watch it too, or to read it too. It's I couldn't stop fault. talking about it. I could not stop talking about it. it uh, I think it had a pretty profound impact on me. In, in many ways, or maybe it reinforced a lot of my negative thoughts about life. I don't know. It's depressing. I liked it. It was good. <laughs> Alan. Uh, I'm Alan. And I used to have a YouTube channel. Um, I also read Stoner. Joanna. What? <laughs> Alan I, still has I, a YouTube channel. I also like Stoner. And <laughs> Library of Alexandria, everyone. Oh, yeah. Library of Alexandria. You can go there. There's no videos. I really, yes, there just, are. I'm really just biding time till I can transition into game show host. <laughs> <laughs> Merv Griffin, give me a call. And then Joanna. Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Joanna, and I have a channel that's called Joanna or Joanna Reads is the handle. And um, I picked up Stoner last year after hearing Jimmy and Alan talk about it. I had heard about the book before. I also had the idea that maybe it was about a stoner. I think I even thought it was called a stoner at first. <laughs> um, but I, I picked up the audiobook because they talked about it. And it ended up being my favorite book of last year. And my, my channel mostly focuses on fantasy literature. But I feel like a fraud at this point because this was my favorite book of last year. And um, I, I just finished my reread or re-listen of that book today. So I did re-listen to it in preparation for this discussion. Um, I love this book and I disagree with the idea that it's tragic. So I do too. I'm really excited to talk about it. Hmm. Curious. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Joanna. Let's beat Jimmy up. Okay. Oh, I'm so, just curious. I didn't say I was defending anything. <laughs> no, 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 no. I wanted to be a fight. Williams it's, himself didn't consider it tragic. Williams did. Yeah, he said he was a hero. Yeah, yeah he did. He said it in the forward of this book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he's a schmuck, but. <laughs> so all these channels will be linked in the description. I picked this book up because I was on a live stream with Jimmy, Alan, and Joanna, and they all beat me until I checked the book out from the library. So. I, you, I was coerced, and I believe Thank Philip, you, you were, so much you were for letting well, us right? force you into reading Stoner. <laughs> <laughs> Huge achievement! I you was were, pretty you much were... uh, threatened, actually. Threatened John as well. Was going to come after me, and mm -hmm. actually, she sent me the book to make sure <laughs> I would read it. So I had read this much or else. Me. Yeah, I was in fear of my life. So. Horse head in your bed, kind of situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's such a good movie. I've never seen it. <laughs> so I'm going to do a, a quick plot summary uh, bullet points for anybody who needs it, not Joanna, because you've read it more recently than me now. <laughs> yeah. But you can correct me if I forget anything, Joanna. Um, so we start with Stoner, farm boy in Missouri, and he goes off to the University of Missouri where he studies and then eventually starts teaching. 
he becomes good friends with a man named Masters who goes off to war and dies. Um, and then when a few people do return from war, there's a party where he meets Edith, the one, the only, his wife to be. They have an interesting introduction. <laughs> Alan. They have an interesting introduction uh, where he falls in love with her immediately and she has a hard time opening up, we'll say. Um, <laughs> then uh, he meets her parents who are just as open and lovely as she is. Uh, they eventually get married and start a life together to include a mortgage that is too too heavy <laughs> for them and eventually a daughter. It's a nice house. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Stoner works at the university. He uh, really falls in love with his career. He starts writing and he is very happy with a very simple life. Um, but then after a colleague, Sloan, dies, a man named Lomax joins staff. And um, at first it all seems fine. And then it doesn't. <laughs> um so Lomax uh, ends up having a bit of a vendetta against Stoner uh, when a charming young lad named He's Walker. not. He's not charming. He is, you don't like Walker? I'm confused. No one likes Walker. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Stoner. Like, he is, like, are you kidding? He's a snake from day one. He's so lazy. Walker Jones joins Stoner lazy, class. Lazy, <laughs> F. F, We're in the summary, Alan. He yeah, is Walker. You're, you're saying that's uh, true about the summary. You know what? You're being a great Walker right now. Uh, uh, no, when I failed, <laughs> I was like, you know what? That's fair. That's fair. I think I Murphy know. was being slightly sarcastic. I have autism. <laughs> that's ableist. Oh. I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I was being sarcastic. I don't like oh, Walker. You gotta let me know. Oh, he's the worst. So Walker uh, joins Stoner's class. He's disruptive and generally insufferable. Uh, Stoner gets him an F, which leads to Lomax suddenly hating Stoner. Um, and Lomax gives Stoner a bad schedule. Eventually, this all kind of comes to a head when they have to do an oral exam where Walker has to prove himself. And Stoner draws a line in the sand. He will not pass this kid who is not, shouldn't be getting a pass. prepared. He doesn't know the material. Oh, no, he's a you mess. Don't pass. Not a conditional. Well, we'll just give him a condition. No, we will not give him a conditional pass. <laughs> yeah. Get out. Get out. Yeah, no. That was one of my favorite scenes of the book. It's oh, powerful. It's it is such thing. a good scene. It's such a good scene. Yeah. In all its so, all glory. Yeah. Edith experiences some kind of postpartum depression after she has Grace, their daughter. She shuts herself in her room. Stoner ends up raising Grace pretty much on his own until Edith uh, <laughs> starts being involved again. <laughs> What's that, Alan? You can't have him be happy. So yeah. no, you're right. Oh, she's the worst. Edith, Edith yeah. and Walker deserve each other. Yeah. I love so, the way that um, he describes it to you in the story because he's like, he senses um, Edith's new campaign. He keeps on describing it as campaigns, like she has a yeah. campaign to like bring it's him a, down. It's an apt description. <laughs> I, I actually felt bad for Edith, but I'll explain why later. Same, oh, yeah. same I did same too. Time. And I have a lot of feelings about Edith. Hey, yeah. Okay, cool. I will stand here on the corner in the rain by myself. I have no. <laughs> uh, you There's know a what? Lot to you don't have her, to be though. a douchebag, Edith. You don't. We'll no we'll have to Edith. dedicate a whole bunch of time to Edith because I have a lot of feelings about Edith. She so sucks. move on. But she does <laughs> suck, but there's some layers there. So Edith um, ends up suck. keeping Grace from Stoner and pushing Stoner out of his own house, essentially, um, in a lot of ways. And he kind of lets it all happen, kind of lets Grace's life get ruined and his own as well, which sucks. Yeah. Um, enters into a love affair with a student called Catherine. And uh, Lomax destroys that, too, because, you know, Stoner can't have nice things. And then eventually Grace gets pregnant, gets married. Her husband dies. Stoner gets sick. He dies, too. End of book. Yay. <laughs> that is literally it. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. much it. We're done here. There's the plot. <laughs> yep. Thoughts. Alan, you go. Give me your thoughts on Stoner. On Stoner. 
um, so, uh, what do you mean on the book? The book. What are you? So what's like your? Reading, when I was reading Stoner, I knew that this was the best book that I had read that I didn't like, because um, I was just <laughs> like, I don't like this book because I do not like. It's just so. It's just too real, and it's just. It's just like. It's. It's just depressing. I'm just like I don't like this. Like I don't want to. I don't want to see the ghost of possible Christmas futures. You know what I mean? I'm um, <laughs> being a teacher. And then, and I, and I, but the thing is, I recognize Williams, Williams's brilliance. I just was not connecting with it. And then we had the dissertation defense scene. And that is what I had been waiting for the entire book. And all of a sudden, this became one of my favorite books because to, oh, take, something, to take something as boring, like literally, look at the words on the page. Oh my gosh, who cares? Who mm -hmm. cares? But it's a it bunch was, of academic mumbo jumbo. Wait, who cares about a dissertation defense? Who cares about the freaking romantic poetry dissertation defense? That's what I'm talking <laughs> about. Like, oh my gosh, just like, just English, like to the, oh. But it was as if I was watching like the most thrilling thriller. I, like I was physically affected by listening to this i was i became physically angry which i mean oh big surprise like i'm generally physically angry like i was physically angry at what was happening and the fact that lomax like what because you're both crippled like that this is ridiculous like where is the integrity like where's the integrity and stoner finally does what i've been waiting for him the entire book to do which is make a stand take a stand for something because he's let he's let edith run rampant over him he's let edith take grace from him he's let you know like everything he's just become like a past like he's just he's just a, this leaf floating in the river and he finally says no like here the line like picard the line must be drawn here no further and it was brilliant it was so good and then you know everything else that came after it is just like freaking lomax <laughs> punishing him for having integrity like the kid was clearly coached like i hate him i hate him so much and i hate walker and the smug you know you know walker's walking around with his crap eating grin being like oh, hello mr stoner like i will throw you in the river and not call do you have any sympathy for why lomax went after defending walker to such a strong degree walker didn't have any academic integrity he didn't Absolutely. have it in the class and then he tries to like you're not you're not entitled a PhD. Like if you Absolutely want to do the freaking work. Like the thing is the kid wasn't stupid. He was intellectually lazy, which is what which yeah. is what Stoner says. He's lazy. He's not dumb. And so no, as a teacher, no, no. I don't have any like I don't have any defense. Like this is a kid who is making like the fact that he's had a difficult time in life, uh, he's weaponizing it. Like I get it, bud. Like, I get it. And Lomax, I get it too. But like, you're a teacher. It is our job to stand at the gate and educate and ensure that people have integrity and not release people from like outside pressure. Like, it's not, that's not what education's about or it's not what it should be about. And so that idealism right there that Stoner shows in that moment is what it made it an instant one of my favorite books and john john williams is one of my favorite authors like if i i just love roman history too much to put it above augustus but it's just brilliant like he's just it's absolutely brilliant that scene i've never seen something that boring seem seem that exciting like yeah oh, it's so good he's I a phenomenal to writer yeah, I didn't even listen to the whole book again, but I did listen to that one scene again, and I got mad all over again. So, <laughs> so Alan, from a moral stance, I 100% agree with you. That's absolutely not a professor's role to bring personal baggage into something and to try to give a student a pass because of that baggage. One of my favorite things about this book, though, is William's, the way he will present human fallacy in such a um stark and just <laughs> blunt way and just show like edith's depression and her vindictiveness and show Sto stoner's passivity and show lorac lor lorac L lomax's um uh his own personal baggage because i'm sure he's had plenty of mistreatment in his life due to his disability 
and is projecting a lot onto Walker. Um, but he just presents all this in just a blunt, like, here you go. Here's the scene. And he allows us to kind of pick it apart and process it on our own, which I think is one of the reasons why Stoner is such an effective book. Yeah. I mean, if we were supposed to feel like like Walker is not presented as someone to to be, no. <laughs> maybe Lomax, but certainly not Walker. Walker. He's not likable. At every turn. Like and I don't really know why. It's like what, as a teacher, I don't understand when these really, really capable and smart kids just won't just do it. Like yeah. you are you are capable of doing this. Why are you so lazy? So it's it's I don't know. And I get I get it, but like, you know, like we have often like many of us have had people be like I've had people be mean to me my entire life because I don't understand social crap. I don't get to be an a-hole to everybody. Like, oh, uh, I think that Walker is so egotistical. Like, he is on, he gloats in his own ability to fabricate and to embellish, and he's so good at it. And he gets a, he gets a thrill out of it. Like, there's a scene where right. Walker walks into his classroom late from something, and there's a, and there's Walker sitting in the place where he is. He's like, "Wow, you were late for my presentation." And he's acting as though he's the professor looking down on Stoner. And it's just, it's so. I hate him. I hate him. Oh, it's so frustrating. When he walked out of that, um, Alan, what's it called again? A dissertation? A dissertation. Uh, when he walked out of that dissertation. Well, actually, it's, it's, still, not a, it's not a dissertation defense. Is it thesis defense? What is no. it? There is it, it, his orals. It, his orals? Yeah, he, he hadn't started his dissertation yet. Um, it's oh, that's actually. Right. We would call it today probably a prospectus defense. Okay. Um, so it's when you're supposed to be ready to start your dissertation and you Not. have to go before a committee and, and show that you know what you're talking about, that your project is viable. And he didn't know the basics. Uh, so it was clear. And that Stoner's primary concern there was this guy is going to be potentially in front of a classroom teaching mm -hmm. students. We cannot allow that because yeah. he doesn't know the basics. Yeah. Can you, in fact, name any of the romantic poets? Like, right. and, and he, it's just like, are you kidding? Um, well, like, I'm not read up on that particular thing. And then no, <laughs> like, these questions are unfair. It's like we would ask this of a first year. Like what? Are you and then Lomax is like, let me let me reword yeah. your question. So obviously, three no, of I the want poets my question, are this, this, and this. What do you think of this? Yeah, that infuriated me more I than asked anything you a simple else. So well I ask it's a so simple well answer in return. Right, just answer my no, Lomax. I want him to answer my question. Yes. Oh my gosh, the fact that people weren't seeing through what Lomax was doing immediately infuriated. I think they did. I think they the did see it though, because there was that one new professor, and he just he didn't feel like he could say anything. Right, so he first he didn't feel world, confident he enough. First world defense, and so he was like, I can't really. I don't know what the rules are yet, and um, I think Who's he knew. His friend, the dean, because he he definitely knows. Finch, Finch was Finch, wonderful. Yeah. Finch. He, yeah. Finch. he tried his, his darndest. Would have taken it. Take. He offered the deanship to you, and you're like, I don't want it. Well, look what happens now, Stoner. Like the chairman role. Chairman. Yeah. Have you, when you sat on those committees, have you yeah. ever had someone like Walker go through that freaking go through the room? No, no. I, I, actually, to tell you the truth. The, the mentor figure, the, the, the direct supervisor is usually the, the toughest, will we'll give the toughest questions, the one that works with you the closest. It I've never seen a case where that person is basically trying to push their student through the way <laughs> that Lomax was doing um, and, and clearly identifying with the student in a way uh, because of their similar disabilities and, and stories, but uh, he was investing his himself in that student in a way that's unhealthy, clearly. Uh, but um, yeah, I've never seen that before. I, I, I'm not saying it doesn't ever happen, but it's not something I've ever seen. Uh, it, it's And it's a very, very unhealthy situation, uh, obviously, because why that person- just prepare him? Like, why not just, why not just prepare him so he can do it instead of I because he's lazy, it. probably, and Lomax saw this as the only way. Lazy. Yeah. Hmm. So, Philip, while you have the floor, I, before I go into, I have specific talking points I want to hit, but before I hit those talking points, I want to get initial thoughts from everybody, like how this book, what this book was for you. So, while you have the floor, Philip, how, how did you take this book? 
I read this as very much an existentialist book and similar in some ways to Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea or something like that, where it's a matter of living in a world that can feel dark and meaningless. And you see that in a couple of key scenes, I think, like when Stoner's father dies and he goes back to the farm and he's just looking out the window and there's this grayness and it feels like the entire universe is just this grayness. Or there's a later scene when he's sitting in his office and it's snowing outside and it's dark out and he sees the, the, this, the snow and there's this, this vast nothingness and life feels that way. And how do you make meaning out of an existence that has no intrinsic meaning? And I feel like Stoner is heroic, similar to the main character in Old Man in the Sea, in his struggle to craft meaning. And he finds it in literature. He finds it in the most beautiful way. I, I, I was very moved by how Stoner, and I had that moment as a student when there's this fire that is just lit inside you and you're passionate and you pursue this to its absolute ends as much as you're able as, as, a, as a flawed human. There's just so it's such beauty in that effort and in that striving, even though the end is sort of inevitable, but there is this beauty in that striving. And that's how I took this. It's very much an existentialist book. Interesting. Joanna, you seem to have a more hopeful uh, perspective on it, or not hopeful, but a more like, I don't know, your perspective seemed different from that. So go for it. No, I think, well, I, first of all, I loved what Philip said. And I actually agree that I would say it's an existentialist. I do get an existentialist feel from this book, but in the most positive, positive way. Um, so here's what I've noticed, especially upon the reread. So I noticed that the, well, the moment, what, I'll, I'll say this, when I read the book the first time, the moment that I knew that this was going to be a favorite and I called my mom and I said, mom, you need to pick this up. And she did. And so we actually listened to it kind of alongside each other is the moment in which um, he's talking to Sloan and Sloan tells him at the very beginning, he said, isn't it obvious you're going to be a teacher and you're in love. It's as simple as that. And it was as simple as that. Yeah. And it's the moment he falls in love with literature and he's reading the pages and he's, he, he has that experience that Philip is talking about where he, he's suddenly immer immersed in this new world, this expansion of what life could be, the possibilities beyond what he could fathom in agriculture in the life where he grew up. It's so beautiful. And I think he starts to experience that too when he starts to first meet Edith and he daydreams of what that could be. Hmm. And sadly, of course, that's not what he gets out of his relationship or his marriage with Edith. But the hope is there. And I think one thing that I also noticed on this reread was the relationship with Catherine Driscoll. I think that was actually a very pivotal moment in the book. There are several pivotal moments, including the dissertation scene, which we talked about. I love that whole scene, of course. But with Catherine Driscoll specifically, there was a passage in which they both are intimate. And it's beautiful the way I think it's portrayed, because at first it's an embrace, a hug, and they almost feel afraid to let go of the hug because of what is going to be unleashed there. And they're almost afraid of that. And then when there's um, a revelation they happen that happens, and I love revelations in stories. I love when a character has a revelation. So the revelation that happens at the beginning is that he's going to be a teacher and that he's in love with literature. He's never going back to the farm, but the revelation he has when he's in a, when he has this love affair with Catherine Driscoll, a, a revelation that they both share is what love can be, but also the embodiment of passion and love. And they talk about how they saw it before as academics that that had to be two separate things, that their passion was up here, was more like a cerebral kind of thing that could never be fully embodied. And so like at the beginning of the book, when he gets in front of the classroom for the first time, he's kind of even shocked by himself that the passion he feels for literature doesn't come through in his teaching immediately when he first starts. He feels like his voice is kind of deadpan and he's like, why is this not working? Like everything I think and feel about this beautiful experience is not coming through in my body language, in my mouth, in my speech. 
And eventually he finds his flow with teaching, but he's almost out of body when he does find it. Mm -hmm. With Catherine, he embodies that passion. And I think that that was, um, that was a revelation for him. And they find, oh, wow, we can be ourselves. We could never be ourselves before. But the sad thing is they had to hide it because it was an affair. And then, of course, that all comes crashing down. But you have to keep in mind there was, there was a beauty to that, too, because they recognized that was going to be the way it had to be. Like they realized that if they tried to have the love affair and go further and make it not secret and leave the university, they would be different people. It wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't, it could never continue. So there was kind of a beautiful accept, acceptance to that and a beautiful understanding of what love is. And I feel like so much of this book is the discovery and understanding of what love is. And yes, he has regrets at the end. But that doesn't mean his life was a tragedy. We all have regrets at the end. But there's so much beauty there, even in the last moments. It's almost like he's rediscovering himself <laughs> like a child with his hands, with the book. It, there, there's so much there. I'm sorry. I could go on and on and on. No, no, I love it. I love it. I actually, yeah. I very much agree with a lot of what you're saying, Joanna. And I think that one of the beauties of this book is that Stoner's loves and his passions were so simple. He wanted to teach. He wanted this career where, where he could communicate his passion, as Alan put it, to others and, and you know, to to give that to other people. Um, I think it was Alan that said that. And uh, as well as, it wasn't you, sorry. <laughs> and, okay, Philip, as Philip said, and uh, <laughs> as well as, as well as he had this dream, this vision of love at home, of, of this domestic life. So he just wanted this career that he could share this passion and he wanted a home life where he could have passion and love. And because he projected, as you put it, Joanna, he ended up with uh, a very, uh, something that crumbled very, very quickly. And his relationship was with Catherine was him discovering real love, not this idealized love that he tried to create. Right. Just one clarification. Oh, and I, um, which is that Catherine is not his student. She. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, it's okay. Is he it's, a student at the university he teaches at? No, no. Okay. Yeah, she she's actually a lower level like instructor, faculty member. Um, so, um, um, okay. Faculty member, definitely. He is a senior faculty member, so there's still a, a, a there's huge, still a power imbalance, and she does big take power imbalance, class. and it's inappropriate, and she does audit his class, um, which is not oh, quite the same as the being his yeah. student. Yeah, she audits his class. So, no, no. <laughs> So it's still a it's still a big no no, uh, but she is not technically his student. Uh, Good, guys, thank you for that clarification. I don't know why I remembered her as a student. No, because uh, it seems like that kind of relationship, but but it's not I'm quite. Jimmy brings it back the other thing I wanted to add right. to what Jonah, I thought was just that was beautiful what you said uh, about the ending. And I, one moment that really got me was when he got Catherine's book that uh, that she had written, and she he saw the dedication that was dedicated to his initials, that was powerful. I thought that just yeah. sort of encapsulated that whole, what you were talking about, Joanna, about they had this passion and they had to hide it. And then eventually it was, it was gone, but there was still that beauty of having had that at least. And so. actually in that moment, uh, he says, it says in the book that his eyes blurred when he sees that dedication, my eyes blurred <laughs> hearing that. <laughs> And he talks in that moment right after that about in all his 60 years, because he's 60 years old, that he realizes that he, he talks about even with all of the impassivity and the removal of self from things like the distancing he does, that he realizes in that moment that the passion was there, is there. It's always been there. It was there when he when he had the love affair with Catherine. It was there when he... Um, he talks about various scenes in his life where the passion was always there. And I think that that's one thing that I love so much about Stoner because that, you know, we talk in literature um, or in books all the time, or when we talk about characters, we always talk about the one note character. Stoner is the most, the furthest thing I've ever read from a one note character. And I feel like if there's any character in literature that I wish I could interview, it's, it's William Stoner. I wish I could talk to him. There were so many questions that came up in my mind when I was like, when I was, listening to this again. And I, I think that 
But yeah, his passion is always there. It's always there. He just doesn't know. Like with, um, and with Edith, I just don't think he knows how to handle that. I don't think that was an easy situation. I feel like with our modern lens, it's easy for us to be like, just tell her, you know, this isn't going to be the way it is. And he even questions that in himself at the end. He says, you know, like, maybe I could have been stronger. Maybe I could have understood her better. But it, it was difficult. It, I don't think dealing with Edith was easy. It just wasn't. Yeah, I agree. And I have a lot that I want to talk to talk about with Eve, with Edith. We can go in on her. Um, but quickly first, Jimmy, you are the uh, you're the one that kicked this all off. You are the one that made us all read it. So give us your thoughts. Well, I could give a shout out to Christopher Warman, who's the one that recommended it to me. He he's actually an author. He's self-published author of uh, seasons of Alpidone. It's a very good book. Uh, so shout out to him for, for actually being the one to recommend it to me. Um, so there's a quote from stoner uh, and it's one of the more popular quotes, but uh, it's in his 43rd year, William Stoner learned what others much younger had learned before him <clears throat> that the person one loves at first is not the person one loves at last. And that love is not an end, but a process through which one person attempts to know another. Uh, the attempt to know one another, I think, is pretty much the entire center of all the conflicts in this book. Uh, him and Edith, him and Lomax, uh, even losing his friend and understanding like why someone would go to war and then him staying. And like the whole idea of being able to attempt to know somebody else <clears throat> is kind of like the big mystery at the end of the day with, with existence, I think. But the, the thing about Stoner that really impacted me a lot was the fact that uh, he left his home and it was already assumed that he would like be taking over his parents at the farm. I, I don't exactly remember what the exact farm job was, but the idea was that he would come back home. He got an education. That's great. And he'd come back home and he had to like stare his parents in the eyes and be like, I want more for myself than what you can give me. Like what you see as like my lot in life is not enough. And what you decided to do with your life is also not enough. And that is so relatable to me uh, on so many different levels, but just like, it, it's so weird because it's, it's almost insulting to his parents, but it's also, in, he feels insulted that yeah. maybe insult is the wrong word, but he feels, you know, that he's doomed a little bit more. Uh, and he has this like passion to run off it with. And I just, you know, uh, my dad wanted me to be a trash man. I remember like all my friends going off to school, and uh, we couldn't afford it. So I didn't go to college and uh, I did okay in high school, but not enough to like get a full ride anywhere, anything like that. And I remember just being like, what am I going to do? And I remember dad being like, you should go collect trash. And I was, and there's nothing against trash men out there. We need them. Okay. But I'm just saying like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I guess that's, that's what you see for me. And I just remember being like angry, so angry about that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know. I think that the, like that scene is what like kicked off the book for me where I was like, okay, yeah, like, you have my attention. And then you look at the passive nature of stoner and, and yes, in the defense, he like makes his stand. And that's, it's funny enough that ends up getting him punished for like the rest of his life. Uh, which, which is some people look at that and say, Oh, like John Williams is in, inspiring people to be passive, uh, which I don't think is necessarily the case, but uh, the big thing with me is like the passive nature of stoner affects his child very, very much. And someone very important in my life, in my opinion, lived very passive and it had a detrimental effect on me at times. And I don't know <laughs> if people can even comprehend when they're being passive, the destruction that it can like bring to, to the people who rely on them. And, you wouldn't have guessed that that would be the case, but it can be so bad. Uh, so, 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 so bad. So I actually thought the entire marriage and then the father to daughter relationship was just like, like, that's what I latch onto in this book. Um, and then just facing death and, and like the matter of fact nature in which John Williams writes it. And he's able to, to write in such a plain language. Like I've never seen anybody use such plain, normal words and be able to evoke such emotion out of, out of people. Uh, I always thought Robin Hobb did that very well, but like John Williams is superior, like in every way. I just think that he's like so incredible. And it's funny that when this book came out, like the number one criticism against him was that he had journeyman prose and blue collar prose and people trashed his writing because it was not sophisticated. And in turn, 
Um, unfortunately, after his death, uh, it became what most people call like a modern classic. And I think it shows that you don't have to have uh, the fanciest vocabulary. You don't have to always reach for those highest levels um, of, of, uh, of vocabulary to, to reach out to people and connect with people. And I, I just think it's just such a fabulous book. Like it's, it's the common person's book in a lot of ways, which is why people compare it and contrast it with the great Gatsby, which is all about being lavish. And, you know, I would say maybe uh, more active <laughs> and, just as destructive in some ways, but uh, I've heard that comparison a lot and I think it makes sense. So yeah, I love this book. It could be the best book I've ever read. Uh, like I always go back and forth on like where I put that in my brain, but uh, I choose just not to do it because it's, it's hard to think about, but I love this book undoubtedly. I think I'll reread this book maybe more than any other book I've read in my life. Wow. I could tell you it is so good on reread. I mean, I, I loved it just as much. I, I was hanging on to every single word. I, but that was beautifully said, Jimmy, especially about grace. And that's such a good point to bring up. I feel so like out of like outclassed by the way y'all talk about it. Like I don't <laughs> like his relationship with Driscoll. I think it's weird and I didn't like it at all. Um, and I'm just like stoner, like what, what are you doing? Like, and I realize that this is him finally like doing what he wants to do instead of what he thinks he should do. Um, I don't like that. I don't like people giving themselves over to the id. Um, like I, like there's a certain level of decorum stoner. Like, I'm sorry that you missed your opportunity. You made a bad choice and you picked Edith and now your daughter hates you because you wouldn't stand up. Cause all I wanted him to do was to stand up and say, Edith, shut up. Like, <laughs> shut up. When she comes in there, like he could have stood up and said, no, you're like, you're not going to do this with our daughter. I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry, but like, it's just not going to happen. And I hate so much that he didn't do that. Um, so anyway, so that part, the, like Jimmy's talking about with Grace, like I never, I never forgave Stoner for ruining that child's life. Um, and for being also, a piece of ruining her life. I mean, I mean sure, sure. That's fine. Like uh, Edith also ruined her life. Um, yeah. But uh I was proud of him for standing up and doing the right thing. And then, I mean, then he just went off the deep end. So like, everyone's just like waxing philosophical about like, Oh, it's so like their love is so beautiful. I'm just like, I mean, I guess, like, I guess it's about, it's about all this stuff. It's just, when I read it, I see like, a, it's, it's a, it's about like anything, not in the, in, not, not in the university was not really my thing. I'm not a dust bowl kind of farm boy kind of, like, like it's just, it's just not, it's just not me. Like, I don't like of mice and men. I don't like old man of the sea is a terrible book. Um, I don't like, <laughs> like, like they're neat. Wait, old man of the sea is not a dust bowl book. Oh, I know. I'm just talking about bad books. <laughs> um, what this book needed was more 18th century whaling. That's really what it needed. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so six, Alan, six, six once again, people. once again, in a human perspective, I 100% agree with you. Stoner essentially giving up on his home life and then going off and having an affair with someone that he loved more was horrible. That was a horrible move. Oh, he should have. Knows. You forgot what? I just literally forgot that, that he's still married. I thought they got divorced before that. No, there's no, no divorce. Married. No, oh. it's an affair. Then, okay. Yeah. Then yes. My condemnation is like my condemnation is it's upon valid. Him. It's so, so valid. Now, Edith is. Life. Yeah. Edith is horrible, but he didn't try. Like, he didn't try to repair things with Edith. He didn't try to develop a balanced, healthy relationship within his home. He didn't try. He did try with Grace when Edith removed herself. But when she inserted herself again, he gave up. So I'm absolutely with you on a human perspective on your judgment of Stoner. I, I think I'm more so, though, because I feel that Williams intentionally showed the flaws of humanity in each character and didn't try to pass judgment on them, but rather just said, here's some really messy people. Well, now I'm let's unpack that. I am doing it for him because he wouldn't. So I'm yeah, doing no, fair enough. Fair enough. But I think that's part of what makes this book so compelling is that we get to unpack these characters because Williams didn't do it for us. It's also striking that this book is set in like world war two era. And this is the same story we hear about all the time in our personal lives. Right. 
Mm. So and so got divorced and they were going behind the back, but they weren't happy. And there's like this weird like attempt at justification on each side. And it's like <laughs> it's almost a century later and we're still doing it. <laughs> like it's just not, I don't know. It's not good. That's for sure. Should have fired. Lomax. I did feel like he tried in his own way with Edith. Um, even like when he's regretting things at the end, I'm like, but you did try. You he did try. Um, I think up until <laughs> The pregnancy but it was just yeah she had something <laughs> she, well, had, she, she, just she a bit. had i think i i think it's strongly hinted that she was sexually abused by her father oh is it really big yeah. agree philip that's one of the things i wanted to unpack about her uh, big agree so that uh, that affects mm. her relationship with stoner because there is no way she's going to have a healthy relationship with a man after what she went through with her father, there's that scene when she burns all of the stuff that had anything to do with him after he died. And I think, can I run with that real quick, Philip? Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Cause Edith is, she's the most fascinating character in the book for me. She even surpasses stoner because from the moment we met, don't make that face, Alan, from the moment we (laughs) met her. (laughs) It's about not realizing she was molested by her dad. Yeah. 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 Okay. I don't think I realized that either, but I, I do remember um, some of the backstory and like the way it talked about her weird sex. There was a word sexual in her upbringing that I was like, what? I I didn't understand that. Go ahead. So when she, so at first she's very closed off, emotionally closed off, which is a (coughs) very common sign of a child who's been sexually abused. They kind of just like their brain just protects them by closing them off. And so um, she was very closed off. And and then whenever she finally decides to give history on herself, she does it in a very detached way. And one of the pieces of information she gives is that she was raised to be a wife and to be a um, to sexually provide for her husband and to like do all these things. And so she was raised to be a certain something. Um, Then in her on her honeymoon, their unsuccessful honeymoon. The first time they come together, she she goes stiff as a board, turns away, won't look at him, and cries through it, which is a huge sign of, of something horrible in her past. And throughout their entire marriage, every time she agrees to, ha- to come together with him, it's always in that manner. It's always her basically trying to disassociate to get through it. Um, even there are times when he feels like he can't hold off anymore. And so he comes to her when she's asleep or when she's like starting to wake up and she just, again, just disassociates. So there's a lot of signs. And then Philip, as you said, as soon as her father passes away, she burns everything that he owned, everything that he gave her, everything associated with him. She wants it gone. So there's a lot of signs that she feels like she has to be what she was raised to be which is a wife um and a mother but that she deeply resents stoner for having to be this presence in her life that's already been shamed harmed and that's really re- that's really harmed her and so she really resents him and because she doesn't have an outlet to process what's happened to her she ends up attacking him and harming him and trying to break down his life and when he builds up a relationship with their daughter she tries to take that from from him as well because what was happened in her relationship with her father so exactly she's scared yeah, that, she, that she sees herself in her daughter and she sees her father in stoner so yeah. she's scared. and I don't give him a left grace, but that's no. her fear. It's not rational. Yeah. But Stoner, that's... absolutely, you're right. Stoner absolutely would never do that to oh. Grace, but it doesn't matter when you're a victim that hasn't healed. You project, and she much much like Lomax did. Um, he projected <laughs> big time on Walker, and he kind of made Walker his self that he tried to fulfill, giving him privileges. Uh, because so many many things were probably barred from him. And the same thing was happening with Edith, where she projected what happened to her onto her daughter, and she was afraid of her father having a relationship with her daughter. She was afraid of her husband having a relationship with her daughter because she didn't want that cycle to continue, and it was the only way she could process that. So Edith was horrible. She was an absolute nightmare of a wife. But I find her so fascinating because, because I feel like I – 
can see so much trauma in her that's caused her to have these behaviors. Yeah, I hard agree on that. Yeah. I wonder if Stoner could too, you know, if that was part of it too. I don't, I don't know. know if you ever you think this on an intuitive level. I don't mean like consciously. I just I imagine. hope not. That would make me really hate him. No, 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 no. I don't mean consciously. I, I, and I'm probably wrong. I'm just speculating. But um, I'm just mean like on some deep, like sensitive, intuitive level. I, can't, I mean, he knows he just can't get you think that's why he gave her so much. Like he didn't push her because he could tell something deeper was happening. Is that what you mean? I mean, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. It's also just interesting, like the time in which it was written. So uh, I think it was published in 1965 or 1964. Um, and Stoner supposedly was, you know, he fictionally was born in 1891. And then it all happens around like a World War II type type situation. Right. So it's like what the country was and what society was like, especially like the effects of the war. Like, I feel like there's definitely something there with that. And like, that has to be one of the reasons why he picked that time period as well. Um, but you have somebody like the very traditional, like housewife. And then the man comes home, brings home the chat, whatever it might be. And Stoner was so okay with that. Like he was like, I'm down, I'm down for the traditional life. I'm down to work. I'm down to just do what I'm supposed to do and, and go through that. And for him, it, that works. I mean, he gets to go and do his job and something he loves. And it's just interesting that like that um, construct at the exact same time was so triggering to Edith, like yeah, what's supposed to be normal and, and right to do um, just almost accentuated a lot of her problems. Um Obviously, also, society was very different back then. Uh, you know, she wasn't seeing a therapist or anything like that. So there's there's that, too. But I just I don't know. I looked at like the uh, the American dream type thing and, and, and what it looked like. And I think in by 65, when John Williams was writing this, I think a lot of that was starting to be questioned, um, oh, yeah. especially definitely into the 70s. But he, he didn't write it then. So I'm just thinking of like you know, 1960s and rock and roll and the hippie <laughs> movement, well, like the, the country was very different. So maybe in some ways it might've been a critique about the time period as well. That's well said. Cause I mean the, you know, the feminine mystique, did that come out in the fifties or sixties, fifties? Um, yeah. 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 Right around that but, time. It, but I like that John Williams is pointing out that this was an issue that's been going on way further back <laughs> for a longer mm -hmm. time. But that's such an interesting point. I was curious, I'm curious to hear your all thoughts about that too, because in this particular book, we go through World War One, we go through uh, the Depression, the Roaring Twenties, the Depression, World War II, we go through a lot of history. And I, it's interesting because the first time I read this book, I got this sense, and I guess speaking to Stoner's, the passive part is that <coughs> I felt like, especially with his experience when people are enlisting in the army for world war one and doing their duty and masters goes and everybody's going and he doesn't go and he chooses not to go. And he even like, doesn't feel anger towards Germany or not Germany. He doesn't feel anger towards, I don't remember like the, he doesn't, he doesn't feel anger about the war or he doesn't feel the same emotional drive about the war in world war one. And I remember thinking, wow, it's like, Things are happening on the outside. There's a lot going on. Even with the 20s and the 30s, um, when I first read the book, I, I saw it as like, oh, he's not really connecting to all these things that were happening at the time in the external world. Um, he's more internal. But then the second time I read it, I noticed that again, that maybe he had a different perspective about war. And then mm -hmm. at, at the beginning, but then as we go on in the story, it feels like he starts to connect more. So like, for example, when we get to the depression, he starts looking at the people who don't have the secure position that he has at the university. And he starts to feel empathy for them, even if they look at him in a judging way, because he has what they don't. And he starts to like, when we get into um, post World War II, when the veterans are coming in mm -hmm. to the university system, he feels he's enjoying the different um, atmosphere that they're bringing into it or the different 
the different maturity and the openness to <laughs> working hard that they're bringing towards things. And it feels like he has a deeper, a different kind of connection to things. And he even talks about how he finds in himself towards the end, having these, like, um, he finds himself feeling this sadness towards things. And at the same time, feeling this, like this attraction towards the violence at the same time as he feels, um, a aversion towards it like this weird dichotomy this weird tug of war feeling so i don't know it was just what did you all think about his perception with all these events that were happening well, i think you described, i think you described it very well i you you're absolutely right he's a very internal person um and that and to some degree uh, is why even when he has his two friends who sign up for the war um masters and finch by the way i thought that was really interesting how masters is sort of a ghost even in in all along the way in this this trio uh, this friendship uh and how that evolves and how it feels like stoner is friends with finch but at the same time they don't really know each other um at the same time and having the absence of, of masters there really affects that but but yeah he's a very internal person uh and there are not that he's not empathetic because uh, he tries in his own way, even with Edith. I think he tries. I don't think he ever understands, by the way, why Edith is the way she is. I don't think he ever consciously understands because that whole all that stuff with, the, with her father goes on with, in his absence. Like he doesn't see any of that. So he has no real, I think, knowledge that, that she's, this is where she's coming from. He just knows that his marriage is, is, a, is a terrible failure and that it has affected their daughter uh, terribly. And we need to talk about, I think, Grace a lot too, because of how she ends up, which is a tragedy in many respects, um, that Grace ends up uh, kind of internalizing a lot like her father, because um, there's this beauty to the, when she's a little girl, their relationship is, is, is beautiful, but then she becomes a teenager and, and being the father of, of someone who's uh, already passed the teen years and, and a teenager, I can tell you that's a point in your parenting where it feels like when they're little, you have, you're, you're, it's like you're driving a car and, and you're fine and you know how to drive a car and you're doing, you know, everything's fairly easy. But suddenly when they become teenagers, the steering wheel disappears and you're just like, what, what, what do I do? What do I do? You know? And it's just kind of, it's not so easy, um, but with Grace, I think there's that additional, what happens between her parents affects her deeply. And uh, the, the lack of closeness is, is, is something that uh, I think scars Grace in a way that she never really recovers from um, and ends up being dependent on alcohol and uh, mm -hmm. deliberately getting pregnant in order to escape from what she sees as the, the, the sort of the dismal situation in her own home life. Um, so there's a, there is a kind of tragedy there, I think. Yeah. I think there's also a rush for people who grew up in those kind of circumstances that <laughs> like some people um, where you're like, you say, you know, get pregnant and run away, but also maybe to hurry to correct the stakes mistakes that the parents have made, like mm -hmm. to immediately wrong those rights and do it their way. Um, I think I've seen that before uh, and it usually ends pretty poorly for the yeah. most part. Um, it, it's, and it's pretty rough. I do have a quote because we were talking about the war a little bit and I don't, we can continue to talk about grace, but I really love this quote about war. I have it written in my notes from when I read it. It says a war does a war doesn't merely kill off a few thousand or a few hundred thousand young men. It kills off something in a people that can never be brought back. And if a people go, goes through enough wars pretty soon, all that's left is the brute the creature that we, you and I and others like us have brought up from the slime. And it's like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty true. <laughs> that's a, that's a very like harrowing de depiction of war, especially world wars. Right. Cause that's like, a, that was a different thing. Um, and I think the reason why he kind of fixates a lot on war in the, in the book, uh, not just because of the time period, but because like history was literally being written at this time. And there's a lot of stuff that happened during that time period that will never get the, um, get the attention uh, that maybe it would have uh, prior. And there's another quote that is about war. And it kind of goes with what I just said. It says, you must remember what you are and what you have chosen to become. 
and the significance of what you are doing. There are wars and defeats and victories of the human race that are not military and that are not recorded in the annals of history. Remember that while you are trying to decide what to do. That's one of my favorite quotes. Sloan says that. I love that. Yeah. 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 So the way I, the way I, what I came away from with this book was uh, the value of an ordinary life. Um, Stoner, again, had very few passions in life. He cared about his career and about instilling that passion to others. And he cared about having a simple domestic life. He didn't want great things with his life. And to me, this book almost felt like an honoring of the ordinary man. You know, so many novels that we read are the heroes and the ones that save the world or save the damsel in distress or slay the dragon or whatever it be. So many stories are about the heroes. And to me, this story almost seemed like, no, it did seem like an honoring of an ordinary, unextraordinary life and showing, you know, you don't have to be remembered by all. And those that you do remember, it could be a very dull, dim remembrance. It could be that you didn't impact every life you touched, but that life is still valuable and that life still has honor and it still matters. And I feel like Stoner's life is given the amount of care, attention, and um, focus that a hero would get. And and so I felt like Williams was showing like, wow, what value this life has, this, mm-hmm. this imperfect, at times depressing, at times, you know, at times um, he, Stoner would look at Joanna, to your point, look at the world around him and see his friends going off to war and see, you know, people making these impactful decisions to put them in the ranks of heroes and he chose to stay behind. But his life was never treated by Williams as lesser for staying behind. He Mm -hmm. still held value as the one that stayed and taught young minds. And to me, that message was really valuable. And to me, that's what I took away from the backdrop of time passing in these big events going by in his life and his life staying the same is just showing the value of those that stayed here and did those little tasks and then died. And that life, wow, what a beauty that life was. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're, when someone's going to their death and which stoner is definitely a book about death as much as it is about life, it's like in that moment, um, whether or not the events of his life were boring or not, it's like he stands in the same place that many other people, will, uh, everyone will stand at one point. And it's like you take that second to kind of almost thank that person for being the one that's standing in that position at that time, um, knowing that that means it's not your time kind of deal. Uh, Cormac McCarthy has a great quote about it. I won't read it because I've read like five quotes and I don't want to be the quote guy. Um, no, there is actually is a really quote good guy. quote in Stoner where he says something along these lines too. Oh, really? Yeah. Where oh. he says, Do it, Joanna. I don't have the quote immediately handy. I have it in my review. I think I read it. My I might have read it in my review, but he basically says something. It's right before the snow scene that Philip was talking about where he looks outside his window and sees the snow but he has this moment where he wonders if his life was worth the living something along those lines. And then he, but then he has the recognition that he, this is not a unique thought that he's not the only person who has thought this. And I thought that was a beautiful existentialist thought because it could be easy to be like, is my what life worth living? And just kind of, kind of going on this ego trip about it, but he's well read. He's read great literature. He understands the human condition. And that was my understanding of that. And yeah. so when he has that thought, he understands that that's part of human nature. And um, I, I just, I love that. Anyway, sorry. I think, he, <laughs> I think he actually answers the question, did my life have meaning? When he is honored uh, at, at the end and he gives this speech <laughs> where I feel like, yeah, it's in a way you see how death gives meaning to life and that he has found meaning in what he did. And he says in his speech is, I have taught. And then mm-hmm. he has to start over. I have taught at this university for nearly 40 years. I do not know what I would have done if I had not been a teacher. If I had not taught, I might have, and then he breaks off. He paused as if distracted. Then he said with a finality, I want to thank you all for letting me teach. Oof. I just thought that was so beautiful. Uh, that is so beautiful. Yeah. And I want to bring that back to the quote that Jimmy 
said earlier about um, you must because I have it here too that you must remember what you are and why you have cho what you have chosen to become and that there are wars and defeats and victories in the human race that are not the military and that are not recorded in history. The quote that Jimmy shared because his he did have a war in his life and and yes while he seemed to feel maybe he feel like he feels like in some ways he lost the war we could interpret perhaps that in some ways he lost the war with Edith and Grace though even that comes to to a peaceful close at the end I would say um to some degree there I think there is some peace there and but really back to the dissertation scene and everything after that when he stands up for his principles for one thing during that dissertation scene or stands up against uh, the walkers of the world <laughs> when he stands up against Walker. And then after that, when Lomax tries to bring him down with Catherine Driscoll um, and he tries to bring him down with changing his schedule. So he's scheduled to read, to teach nothing but freshman English. Yeah. He takes a stand against that. And I think that's something that can go unnoticed. We were like, oh, well, he just accepts it. Well, no, he didn't just accept that. He starts teaching the freshman medieval English. Yes, yeah. but yeah. they were, but you know, and then even later on when he gets his old schedule back, what does it say? It says that the juniors who took his classes as freshmen were the best in the whole university. Yeah. Yeah. They were the best. So, so everybody really... take medieval English. <laughs> okay. But he really he just... took a stand. And then even at the very end, when, um, when Lomax is trying to get him to retire and do that whole, he's like, we could do this whole dinner when, when uh, Stoner first refuses. He's like, you misunderstand me. He's like, you're an, you're, you know, you're a good man, but you're also an SOB. He basically says, uh, <laughs> an SOB. he calls him that. And I mean, yeah. he tells him straight out. He's like, you'd never get, you'd, I don't, I don't care about your petty little game with me. That's, and he, he puts his foot down. So there are yeah. like actually numerous instances in this book where he is not passive, but well, I think yeah. it could easily go unnoticed, but it is, yes, he's passive with, with grace and, and uh, with Edith. And I totally agree with that, but he does put his foot down. He does stick to his integrity in his academic career. And in that way, I really do see him as being heroic in that way. I think he cared more about being a teacher than a father and a husband. I think that was the war he decided to fight. Like he tried harder in those wars because that's what he cared about. I think and that's, that's like the dinner. Like see. he said, yeah, thanks for letting me teach. Like that's what he wanted. That's just what the dude wanted to do. Yeah. I don't think he felt like he could succeed in his home life. Um, whereas he could win these little victories as, as a teacher. Um, he and was, he, a, he did succeed as a father though. He was a good father to Grace. When she was and little. when Edith came in and took Grace from him, he did not fight for her. Yeah, it's the worst part. But, I, um, yeah, that's rough. That's rough. Like, because Stoner is a character that you can have so much compassion for, but, you know, that that's rough. Yeah. yeah. I, I admit that. I, I, I had a hard time. Even at the end, I, I did struggle with that. Like, the, the part where Stoner and Edith is, sorry, Grace is an adult and she has an alcohol problem. And he tell you reflects to himself. Well, I'm glad she has her alcohol. I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> that no. was a bit <laughs> hard to swallow. So bad, dude. <laughs> I can admit that. I was like yeah. my grandma. I'm not. I'm not kidding. Like so much of my grandmother is in this book. Oh, no. She's dead now. I can talk about her. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but she was. She was like Edith. She was like Edith. Um, so much of the stories I heard about my grandmother very much edith and uh wow. things edith passed on and and stoner passed on. it just yeah crazy and relatable really did perpetuate that cycle where she was very passive in her own life and when she was active it was very much the way edith was active where it was just like all right i'm doing this i'm taking it this is what my life is gonna be and it was not healthy and she did not go down a path that was fruitful for her life or that put her to where she was in a better position than her parents at all. She definitely was affected, as you said, Philip, by her parents' choices. Yeah. I um I like Stoner's body of work and I've come to realize not Stoner, Williams' body of work. Um and I've come to realize when reading fantasy as well that I like that everything that happens 
in Williams's uh, um, bibliography is it's about like people make choices and then they have to deal with that. Yes. And it's it, like it's one of my favorite quotes from Augustus, but I think it, it covers like all of Williams's work. One does not deceive oneself about the consequences of one's acts. One deceives oneself about the ease with which one can live with those consequences. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone in Augustus, in Stoner, in Butcher's Crossing, like they make these decisions. And Williams just he's like a like he's like a weaver spinning a tapestry. And it just like he just lets it go. Like mm -hmm. the people make the choice and he lets it go where it goes. He does not he does not rush in to save them. There is no cavalry incoming to to rescue them from the um you know the 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 boulder coming down the hill of their decisions and i think in fantasy and what we read a lot now i and i'm not i'm not targeting any any particular author but i think there's no power creep yeah i think there <laughs> a, especially in video games that i play i just think there's a lack of consequence yeah for decisions that are made like people make decisions but like it, it, it's just it, it rarely matters yeah. um and i think some of my favorite books recently that i've read since i've been on booktube have been ones where characters make choices and live and oftentimes i hate it i hate <laughs> the result of some of stoner's choices in yeah. that. i hate it i freaking hate it um but i like that he just lets it happen he does not mm -hmm. he is not the benevolent god that comes in and saves his characters from themselves um yeah. And, you know, and, and as, as a teacher, as I see us, like, as society, continue to try to do that for our students and not let them experience consequences, it is, we, like, Williams has it right. Like, this is how people grow and learn. Like, yeah. so not the same at the end of the book as he was at the beginning. Like, yeah. he is a sum of the, of the consequences of his, of his choices. And we are not doing our students, I always come back to teaching, but we're not, we're not doing our students a service by shielding them from the consequences of their actions. Um, and so, I don't know, that's just something that I really like in stories, because it just seems so rare nowadays, or whatever. So, yeah. anyway. Oh, I like no, you're absolutely right, Alan. And I think Walker is a great example of that when he... Yes when Lomax gives him pass after pass and shields him and protects him and he just continues on doing the same thing. He keeps that pompous attitude. He's, he keeps that privileged demeanor. He does not grow and he does not learn because he's coddled. I think, mm -hmm. I, I think back to, sorry, like with my mom, I've told her this. I like my mom bailed me out of every, every mistake that I made. I did not grow up till I was 30 because my stepdad finally told her, you, you got, you're cutting this child off. And thank goodness. But I've told my mom, I'm like, like I, I am so grateful for that because it saved me a lot of hardship. But at yeah. the same time, if she had not, if she had stopped bailing me out, I would have had to figure it out. Like I would have had to, I could have learned some responsibility. And so I, I am a victim of being saved from my own terrible decision-making. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to help my students avoid the same thing. So, yeah. Sorry, Jimmy. Yeah. I love yeah. that. It's that enabling nature that a lot of times mentors and parents have that end up just being a crutch to people mm -hmm. when they mm -hmm. need to learn to stand up on their own. Yeah. And, and, and go ahead, Jonah. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, it's not only just person either. Because Alan, you said earlier that actually it rhymed. You said we stand at the, uh, we educate and stand at the gate or something like that. And I really like that. But the thing is, is like you can see how fast this all breaks down. You know, you let one person in who's going to be teaching, and that was the concern, right? Is that Walker was going to be teaching these things? He's going to be in front of a classroom, and then you have one phony, and then that phony makes another phony, and then there's a bunch of phonies, and and. I don't know if y'all have realized this, but no one knows what they're doing anymore. And I'm one of them. Like I'm a software developer. And I'm like, does anyone know that I don't know anything? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> like it is honestly bewildering to me that I'm like, like people speak to me with like respect. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, but no one around me also, none of them know what they're doing either sometimes. So um, 
this was never more clear to me, by the way. Like I always wanted to go to WWE when I was a wrestler. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, the independent circuit's so terrible. I'm going to go to WWE. It's going to be amazing. Then I went to mm -hmm. WWE multiple times and it was a mess. And I was like, oh, they don't know what they're doing either. Like nobody knows what they're doing. Um, and this is how it happens. And this is how a system can become coddled. And it just, it, it's like a snowball effect. And it seems, it seems, um, so maybe brash would be the word or kind of cold to to say well walker doesn't get you know he has all these issues but he doesn't get a second chance because of them and some people would look at that and be like where's your empathy you know where, where where's that at but the stakes are too high i think i yeah. think they're just too high and yeah. unfortunately uh i think we might find ourselves in that position today <laughs> because there's a lot of phonies not oh, yeah. I everywhere. totally agree with you, Jimmy. It's like it, they're setting a precedent, you know, mm -hmm. but if they just if the stoner caves in, it's like they're setting a precedent. In a way. Yeah. And there's like a bias against excellence. Like I I've, I don't understand that. Like I remember, um, you know, I, I was in Gifted and I was definitely like the kid that like didn't fit in with Gifted Kids because like I liked pro wrestling and Dragon Ball Z. So everyone was like, what's wrong with this kid? And how is he in here? But I eventually didn't keep up with my grades and I got kicked out of Gifted. And never once as a kid that I go, that doesn't make any sense. I literally was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> makes sense. I'm not excellent anymore. So I'm not in. Uh, and it's just how my brain's always worked. Um but, but I, I don't know. It's like having that standard is considered like mean spirited somehow. And I, yeah. I just don't think that that's uh, I don't think that's a good way to, to go about these things. Yeah. It, it's um, this can devolve very quickly into like academic elitism, which is not what I want, but when the entire education system caters to the very bottom, like, like, th like that's where you're going to go. Like if you, if you aim for the top, like people, like people, people will rise to the occasion. As a teacher, I have never, ever lowered rigor and had more people meet the bar. Instead, mm. so if my bar's here, I got people, I got a bunch of people meet like reaching here. If I lower it to here so that more people can clear it, nope, now they're here. They do the exact percentage, like they're going to reach a percentage of the bar. So I stopped doing that. I'm like, this is not helping anybody. So, okay, like, here we go, guys. Get like come like I will help you if you need it, but I'm not gonna low I'm not gonna lower rigor because it doesn't help. Like it it, yeah. it, it doesn't help. It never has. I've been doing this ten years. Like yeah. I still I don't know if you've ever done something similar, but I have never had that experience. I just love how your puppy is trying to reach here when you're putting your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> she has decided she wants to come see me. She's That's really trying puppy. to get my sandwich. Buddy, <laughs> Joanna, you had something you were wanting. Like, oh man, what was I going to say? Yeah. Um, gosh, I don't remember exactly what I was going to say, but I would love to read that quote, if that's okay, that John Williams said about the book. Is that okay? Oh yeah. Okay. It says here, I think he's a real hero. A lot of people who have read the novel think that Stoner had such a sad and bad life. I think he had a very good life. He had a better life than most people do, certainly. He was doing what he wanted to do. He had some feeling for what he was doing. He had some sense of the importance of his job he was doing. He was a witness to values that are important. The important things in the novel to me, the important thing in the novel to me is that Stoner is Stoner's sense of a job. Teaching to him is a job, a job in the good and honorable sense of the word. Hmm. His job gave him particu a particular kind of identity and made him what he was. It's the love of the thing that's <laughs> essential. If you love something, you're going to understand it. And if you understand it, you're going to learn a lot. The lack of love defines a bad teacher. You never know all the results of what you do. I think it all boils down to what I was trying to get at in Stoner. You've got to keep the faith. The important thing is to keep the tradition going because the tradition is civilization. Hmm. Word. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. Is there anything else that anybody else wants to hit on before we wrap it up? Well, I want to thank Jimmy for making us all read this uh, and, and spreading the love. Um, and thank Joanna for getting me my copy and, and forcing me to read it. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I forgot that I read it first until everyone said that because I thought Alan read it first because you told me to read it because you were complaining that I, that I don't ever read anything you recommend me. And you recommended me on chatting with nuts. And I said, Jimmy, I'm not going to read that book. 
because I thought <laughs> it was did. about like I, I thought it was about a drug addict. Like, like, and I'm like, I'm not gonna read, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna read a book about a dude who's high all the time. I'm just not. I knew um, it was, I knew it was considered a modern classic because I had heard of the book before. I heard about it first on Travel Through Stories, Sean's channel. Um, and so I knew that he wouldn't read a book that was, you know, necessarily not well, good. The way, the way <laughs> it was published it was, in the 60s, too. I knew right? he, wrote, he read good books. So I knew it was going to be good. But it was funny because on chatting with nuts, whenever uh, Jimmy was telling Alan about it, I wrote in the chat, I said, oh, I'm going to pick it up. And then Alan started yelling at me. He's like, no, Joanna, you need to stop trying to read everything. <laughs> he actually yelled at me not to read it. That's because that's because every time every time you people get together, you're like someone, someone, one of you says, "Hey, you should read that," and then you guys do. And then I'm sitting here like, "Okay, no, it, I, I'm certain I never, I've never recommended a book to you guys." Oh no, but you were you were online with someone for for ten minutes, and you're going to read their thing? No, no, I get it. I oh, get it. I, I appreciate that. Okay, hey, I've picked up several books on your recommendation, Alan. Yeah. Well, it took John video. three years to pick up Long Price Quartet, which was my first recommendation to her. I didn't have the copy of the book because it was all sold out. It's because your fault, that was your fault. Your fault. That was your fault. The only reason I read Stoner is because Jimmy said, "Hey, it's free on Audible," and I said, "You know what? I need something to listen to, like uh, on the commute, <laughs> That's and it's true, free. Yeah. I'll get it." And I was. Like, and then I get a, a very angry Voxer. Oh my God! This Walker cat. <laughs> <Just> like... <laughs> Like, like I was, it was good. And I knew it was good. I knew it was brilliant without like liking it. And then once Walker entered the picture, I was like, oh my gosh, I hate this child. I hate this child. <laughs> he and was I'm insufferable. So good, Mr. Stoner. Mr. Yeah. Stoner. I remembered something that I wanted to bring up. <clears throat> and this is pure speculation. Did anyone pick up on a potential um, emotional affair between Edith and Lomax? Yes. Oh, yeah. They kissed. Not that I remember, but that makes me mad. They kissed. They Wait. kissed. Unless I what? misheard it. There, when they were leaving, the, when he was leaving the dinner party, he kisses her and they like hang on to the, they're very drunk. I mean, especially he, he Lomax is really, really drunk oh, at that. I think I remember this. But like they, they linger on this kiss for a long time. Was it like a sloppy that. cheek kiss or was it on the lips? I think it was on the lips. Wow. It not? Okay. But it was just like a drunken party kiss. Yeah. Yeah. It was weird. Uh, but the, the, <laughs> the thing is the, that was an interesting thing to what Philip, am I wrong? No, I just thought the way Murphy said that just a drunken party kiss, like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. <laughs> I do that literally <laughs> once a week. No, I mean, because that would, that doesn't necessarily mean an emotional affair. Right. Yeah. But everyone well, knows if you're drunk, it doesn't count. Well, well I don't know. That's not thing. what I meant. <laughs> that's not rule. No, just kidding. But you know what? It's, so that's an interesting, <laughs> but it's interesting because, um, so at that party, Lomax gets, he stays longer. He and his wife stay there longer than any other guest. I think he's yes. with his wife. And yes. he ends up opening up to Stoner about how lonely his life was. And and yes. and Stoner feels a connection because he's like, oh, I've been so lonely too. And they, they're opening up to each other. And he, he feels like, oh, I'm having a connection with Lomax. And Lomax talks about his disability and being alone with literature. Um, and and Stoner, like he, he really has this connection about that. Like, oh yeah, I'm, you know, my situation was a little different, but I had the loneliness and the same revelation with literature opening up the world for me. And then after the party and after the weird kiss, then Stoner tries to approach Lomax and Lomax is really cold to him. And this is before the Walker scene. So I don't know if, I always wondered like a couple of things about that. Like did Lomax maybe feel like he let his guard down with Stoner at that party? Yeah, and that's how I uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, Joanna, I I agree. <clears throat> I don't remember the kiss, but I I did definitely notice that he lingered with Edith, and there were some weird vibes at the party, and that Lomax mm -hmm. seemed to have a grudge against Stoner that was beyond just the Walker situation. But also, there were multiple instances that both Lomax and Edith had information that they should not have been privy mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. You oh, notice man. that too. Yes, I they did. Kind of I, I'm, I'm glad you put. Okay, I didn't make the connection that both of them had it, and that maybe that was why. But yeah, he did. She knew things. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, she, she knew about, about the affair when Stoner didn't tell her. Lomax knew about the um, about the sickness because he had the shared doctor, and then suddenly Edith knew. Was that Lomax or was that Finch? No, I think Lomax didn't know about the cancer. Oh well, then maybe Edith Finch. told Lomax. I don't remember. I don't um, remember what it was, but I remember multiple times Edith one of them got info. I'm sorry. Edith knew a lot. Yeah. Yes, one of them would get information. And then a scene or two later, the other one would have the information that they should not have had. That happened a few times throughout the novel. And I couldn't decide because, as you said, Lomax had mentioned how lonely he was. I couldn't decide if it was a mutual emotional affair or if it was that Lomax was in love with Edith. And Edith just kind of used that to get information on Stoner because she was obsessed with ruining his life. But either way, I definitely and it's completely speculation but i definitely came away feeling like there was something going on behind the scenes between those two i've asked john williams let's email him right now i got it <laughs> okay <laughs> that literally like I makes me hate Lomax and me this way more <laughs> i hated both of them. i didn't care i hated both of them so i was like y'all do what you do i don't care oh I mean, yeah near everyone in the novel is hateable <laughs> not finch yeah. i love finchy finch was lovable <laughs> We I just mean, didn't get enough of him, or we would have hated him too, John. Finch, John, let the lens not uh, linger too long on him. Finch is doing his best. He just like he's just he's like, really trying. Are why are these people so persnickety? Like, I mean, there's is- a guy who's benefiting from the system. Basically, he's not really up to any of the situations he's put in. He's often the least intelligent guy in the room. But that's not nice, he, he, Sorry, but I mean, but he, but he gets nice he, here somehow he just gets through it all and and uh and he was loyal to stoner as well um i liked yeah. that i really did like that aspect of their friendship i like that he did try to protect stoner from Lomax yeah. as much as he could yeah no yes he too was quite passive though like when he asked stoner would you want the chairman position and stoner was like no nah, i don't want that and he's like whoa good no conflict all right i'm just gonna give it to the other guy then oh that was the worst i it forgot just- about that too he just doesn't want to like. He doesn't want his job to be harder than it is. Look, That's I get so it. True. Like, That's you, so like, true. That is why. So there are so many bad teachers because you just don't want to deal with it. Like, like you have to. You really have to go to great lengths to prevent the kids from cheating, to punish them when they do, to like make sure. Like, it's sometimes I get it if people are just like this ain't worth it. Like, like, and it's a good thing that Finch became an administrator because he would have been a bad teacher. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There was so. an interesting conversation there where um, Finch was trying to, when Finch first talked to, to, um, to Stoner, when they had the, when he called, Finch called for a few days to cool off. And then he talked to Stoner about it. And I think he was trying to kind of convince Stoner to let up. And Stoner said, and he, you know, he wasn't going to let up. And then Finch said something like, oh, I know it's about the principal. And then Stoner says, no, it's not about the principal. It's about not letting walkers into the school system. And yeah. I thought it was interesting that he he framed it that way. It was yeah. very distinct. It wasn't about the principal. It was about the matter yeah. of not I mean, if, if Walker were a teacher, it would ruin acad- ac- academia for yeah. so many kids to come. And students, oh. yeah. Yeah. And then I you found the kiss part, by the way. Um, did you find I, it? I did, but it's it's weird because it does describe it as a chaste kiss. Um, at least Stoner thinks so. So let me see if I can. Uh, Lomax shook Stoner's hand, asked him about his book, and wished him a great success on it. He walked over to Edith, who was sitting erect on a straight chair, and took her hand. He thanked her for the party. Then, as if on a quiet impulse, he bent a little and touched his lips to hers. Edith's hand came up lightly to his hair and they remained so for several moments while others looked on. It was the chastest kiss Stoner had ever seen, and it seemed perfectly natural. Okay. <laughs> I do remember what? that now that you've said it. because I remember thinking at the moment, like, ooh, all right, shouldn't have done that, dude. And then it went on for several minutes, and I was like, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> oh, God, that's terrible. Why, why would it be natural? Does it mean they've done it before? Maybe that's what he's seeing. Yeah, I don't think that's what it is. They both suck. Who cares? I mean, they do suck. Maybe he's maybe he's stoner in that moment is realizing that they should have been together. 
Maybe he meant that like, they seemed natural, as if like their wow. interactions seemed like this was commonplace uh, to them. Like, maybe so much confidence had... in the movement that no one questions it. Everyone's yeah, like, it, it, it felt, yeah, like it seemed <laughs> like, oh, this seems like something that's natural to them that they've done. Because keep in mind that Stoner, anytime he's shown Edith any sort of physical affection, she freezes. And the fact that she responded to Lomax uh, would have been very foreign to him. And should have also destroyed Stoner and he should have punched Lomax in the mouth. And I'm, I'm trying to remember if, um, I'm trying to uh, know, that's really, that was weird. I'm trying to remember if Edith was dr was drinking at that party. I, don't I think, think she was. She, was she? Okay, because I remember at the beginning, before when they're setting up for the party, she was a little glasses. nervous about having alcohol because I think prohibition was going on at the time. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, was this so at the she, party where she freaked out because there weren't going to be enough champagne glasses for everyone? Yeah. And then yeah. Yeah. became a NASCAR mm -hmm. driver. And, no. what? Yeah. and he story. runs out to get the cups and she locks herself in her bedroom mm -hmm. and he comes back after seven yeah. and people are there and she's just like, and she's just natural. being the party girl. That's <laughs> right. The wonderful hostess. That would be weird if she weren't drinking and she responded oh, that way in the middle of the party. Hair. That's a wrap, dude. She touched his hair, dude. That's what a five are you doing? Shuffle around these parts for partner. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's Stoner. the touching of the hair that's almost like the the, the weird. So, uh, Alan, Stoner how do you feel about created. Stoner now? You should now that Stoner you know. Created Edith for better classes, <laughs> if like Lomax wanted her. <laughs> no, Alan, how do you feel about Stoner now that you see that Edith was potentially having an affair as well? How do you feel now about Stoner's oh, affair? You're right. Um, I've always lived by the maximum if someone else is going to do it. Um, that, <laughs> One makes it all right for the other. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's how morality works. Like, it totally is. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. You're back I'm to not... hating Edith now, right? Like, oh, no, no back I, on that I, hill. I am judging both of them for their poor decision. <laughs> if you do not want to be with your partner, get like pick them to the curb and then you can be with who you want to be. Like that is that is the deal that you made. Honor your responsibility. He, but I think he really did hold out hope as long as possible because I was Grace born. No, Grace was born at this point, I think. Yeah. But yeah, I know like leading up to Grace it when she born. says that she wants to have a child, he says. Edith, I think this is wonderful. I, I'm excited that, you know, we're going to have this child because he, he thinks in his mind that maybe that'll make them connect more. And then when they go in this strange sexual episode with her stripping the covers off the bed and laying there all day <laughs> waiting for that him. Was, that was um, before. That was when she decided she wanted to get pregnant. Yeah. So when, when she was trying to get well, And then like he, some, the sad yeah. part about that is that like it didn't is that it didn't make them any closer mm -hmm. Uh as a couple, as he had hoped, he had hoped it would, and it didn't. Yeah. How often have we seen people try to fix the problems in a relationship by uh, having a baby? I was literally and about to say that. It has yeah. never worked in the history of mankind. Yeah. Sophie Turner and Joe Jonas are getting a divorce, guys, and they just had a kid. Look, Jimmy, I am at, this is my shocked and awe face. Like, I can't believe, you mean two celebrities are getting a divorce? I'm still sad. I was cute. sad. Just because she was Sansa Stark. That's the only reason. Exactly. Just because just she was Sansa Stark. Stark. Ah. Here's about the Jonas guy. <laughs> Philip looks. Philip know. looks shocked and then. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Me either, Philip. Me either. It's the lady <laughs> that played Sansa Stark. Okay, wait. Oh. She's a little girl. She's not, like thirty. Not anymore. <laughs> oh, I think she's oh, like. Oh, like what? Twelve years ago. <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> is that what her name is? Sophie Turner. Yeah, Sophie, Sophie Turner. Turner. Rip, rip. Okay. Thought those kids had Sophie it. Turner in the role of Edith. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Just kidding. This would be a good movie. <laughs> this would be a good movie. One of those like art house movies that nobody watches. Oh. A24 could do this. So thank you all for joining for this <laughs> chat on Stoner. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really good sign that it's time to wrap it up. <laughs> thank you for hosting, Murphy. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you yeah, so much you. for hosting and thank you for letting us again coerce you into reading Stoner. Well, that was you. great. I'm super glad we did and I'm more glad that we did for the sake of this conversation because this has been so much fun. I'm really glad that we got to dig into it more and everybody's links are in the description so be sure to check everybody's channels out, give them some support and some love um, and we will see you all some other time.
for me would always keep you gotta wait 